Hello, I'm Leonardo Mattiazzi with CINT. I'm here with Carol Grumberg and Sandy Stelling. And um, we're here at South by Southwest, a very different version of it. We were supposed to do this panel on March 16th of 2020 in Austin, and we're doing it three months later from the comfort of our homes um, for obvious reasons. And uh, the topic is not only still relevant, but it's actually even more relevant because we're going to talk about the future and how we see ourselves as customers, as uh, leaders, and our company's role in, in the future that uh, is ahead of us. And our goal is to look a little bit forward. Uh, originally, we we're thinking about looking five years from now as companies uh, most companies at that time uh, supposedly have already implemented their digital transformation initiatives and built a culture around uh, quick adaptation by means of experimentation and measuring what works and not works uh, and always uh, drive its initiatives based on customer feedback. So a much more customer oriented culture um, as the digital transformations mature into the future. And what happened in the past three months, uh, this adaptability has never been so relevant. And what we could see is that many companies realized that they're what, where they thought they were in terms of digital maturity perhaps uh, was not a reality. And some other companies actually accelerated their pace and got things done in three months that would not, were not pr planned for the next couple of years. So we're gonna talk about that and what the future looks like uh, having in mind all of these uh, recent changes. So let's start with uh, some introductions. So uh, Carol, you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Leo. So uh, first of all, thank you. This is super exciting to be doing this in this format. So this is great. Um, and so Carol Grunberg and I am an executive overseeing money movement and innovation at Northwestern Mutual. Um, and so essentially that means establishing the foundation to engage with our clients in a different way, uh, particularly as it comes to payments and uh, new use cases uh, that are relevant to them for establishing financial security. Um, and so previous to this, I was uh, with Alibaba Group where I oversaw um, Ant Financial's growth of the 10 mobile wallets in the portfolio. And it was, uh, I was in the Bay Area for a while with Google as well as head of uh, uh, strategic partnerships for payments. So my background is primarily around um, products and partnerships uh, centered around uh, technology in the US, China, and Southeast Asia. Terrific. Sandy? Yeah, so I'm S Sandy Stelling, and um, I'm a managing director at Alaska Airlines, and I lead our strategy and transformation teams, which includes our change management, our lean process design, our project management office, and guiding the overall company strategy. Um, this is exciting, very different from March. I think the discussion, the conversation we're about to have is probably different than the one we would have had in March, and I'm looking forward to that. And um, right now we're very focused on recovery and restructuring of our organization. So that'll probably play into some of my answers as we, some of my conversation points as we get into this. That's great, thank you. And uh, I'm Leonardo Matias, I'm a partner and EVP at CINT. Um, I'm an entrepreneur myself, uh, have been helping the company to grow from a 10 people team to a 3000 global company over, uh, over the past uh, two decades. And, uh, this is certainly uh, a, a very challenging time for all of us, and we, we're learning a lot from this. So uh, in my role of uh, helping clients to uh, innovate faster and consistently and adapt faster, uh, I think that uh, I'm seeing a lot of uh, that we can take from the past three months uh, and, and use as, uh, as we move forward past this, this time of recovery and, and resilience uh, to become better places to work and, and, and uh, better places to create value to, to our uh, customers. So uh, looking forward to it. So let's start with, uh, with a little bit of uh, uh, visioning 
exercise. So, Sandy, what, how do you envision a day in the life of your customer? Uh, five years from now, it's very different right now, right? So let's, and, and uh, being in the airline uh, industry, I can't imagine uh, everything that, it's, uh, that you and your team, uh, uh, your teams are going through. Uh, let's try to look a little bit further down uh, in, and try to, to see a few years from now. How do you see uh, a day in the life of your customer? Yeah, it's it's an it's a great question, and you know, thinking about it, how I would answer it maybe in March or how I'd answer it today. I don't know if fund if the fundamentals are different. Five, you know, in the five year question, I think that, you know, what our company stands for and the values in which guide us and how we want to serve our customers and the communities. I don't see any of that changing. A little bit now in light is like, how are we going to do it differently? Um, and it, there is a little bit of recall to how the industry was changed after 9-11. And there was, some things went back to the way they were, but there was also an introduction of what became a new normal. And I do expect, and, and, and seeing that to start take hold here of what is the new normal as it relates to passenger and employee safety when it comes to things like a you know um, very contagious virus, when you do put people together, and so um, there's one of the biggest things we're wrestling with is where a brand and our employees have great passion to take care of our of our guests, and it's a very social experience and it's a very community experience so much as like you could say a family experience. And how do you do that where right now there's so much, there's a lack of um, contact, but I think how do you make sure, you, while we still may have to operate in a space that has a lack of contact, we don't want it to have a lack of connection, right? So what does that look like? So what we're wrestling, I think some of the things that we're, we're now accelerating are things that would have, we're, we're always in a roadmap for us of creating more self-service, the ability to cust for guests to do more with their mobile device and not have to transact documents and forms and driver's license and all of this exchanging of things, physical touch, I think is accelerating some of those efforts to help provide um, guests and employee confidence that they could be safe when they're traveling. Um, so I think some of that we're going to see accelerate both our investment and customer adoption of some of those offerings. But it's finding how they're going to traverse the airport experience the flight. Um, we're already seeing early recovery that tell that our, we're hearing our customers tell us what, what they want us to bring back faster. Mm -hmm. And so um, a specific example is on board with food and beverage. A lot of that was taken way down to essentially water. And now they're like, now customers are, we listen to our customers every day and we're hearing through surveys and other instruments we have. And we're hearing like, the demand for more to come back. So we're actually working to accelerate returning some services on board um, because the cust our customers are saying that's what they need. That's what they want. We're like, great, let's do it. So they're actually going to help pace our recovery. And mm -hmm. I think it's important that we're constantly listening to where, where their comfort and confidence levels lie. Cool. And these uh, initiatives that have been accelerated, would you, would you have a, a measure of that? Like things that were perhaps going to happen one year from now or two years from now are happening now or I think it's I think it's two one there was there's a couple of things that we're looking to accelerate that were in the 2021 22 2022 time horizon that were being worked right now we pulled those left there's also some things that have been in the backlog for quite some time that are now being brought forward so we see it coming both ways of things that were more futuristic in our mindset coming, pulling left and things that have been on the backlog and, and sort of just lagging there are being pulled in because now they're much more relevant and much more important than maybe the case was to be made six months ago or a year ago. Mm -hmm. Cool. Carol, you want to bring us uh, your own perspective? Yeah. So the day in the life of the customer, I think five years from now is, going to be where I see the single use case scenario kind of going away. And what I mean by that is 
Right now, customers, clients, users, they go to certain companies uh, that they like to get X product or service. Well, I think if the last three months is indicative of anything is that um, companies, even whether it's a technology company or a company like Northwestern Mutual that's been around for 162 years, they are able to all operate very much like um, have the agility of, of deploying products and services much more quickly um, and to operate more like technology. And that means that they're able to then provide uh, services and products to their clients to meet their overall needs for whatever industry they happen to be in. So um, I do see customers having this more interconnected set of experiences with all the companies that they engage with, or rather the companies that will be strong in the next five years will have a more integrated set of services that they're able to offer their, their clients. And so clients will have a, a lot more kind of robust ecosystem uh, of things that they're accessed, making it just a lot easier and more convenient for them to do business in general. How, how, what do we need to do to keep that momentum and, and that agility? Yeah. Well, I think uh, for, for one is recognizing, you know, COVID led us to work, forced us to work differently. It also forced us to show up differently. So with people working at home, uh, that lends itself to a level of informality, right? And transparency, authenticity, all the things that organizations try and get their culture to embrace, it just had to happen by default, right? People are managing their families, managing their schedule, managing a different way of working. And so as a result of that, uh, you know, the lack of pretense, so to speak, has enabled people to really be more creative, be more collaborative. And so um, I think one of the things is really uh, the benefit of culture is, I think, uh, one of the things that is rising to the surface, right? And the culture in that, you know, really the importance of fostering this unity uh, amongst your employees, your executives, um, in connection to your clients. Uh, it, it's, that is integral to successful whatever product or service a company is in. Because again, uh, it's been unparalleled, I think in almost every industry and um, across different verticals, you hear just, wow, this is such an incredible way to work. A lot of it is uh, the fact that people are just showing up as, as they are, right? They're literally in their homes. And so um, the impact of people being able to feel at home while at work um, is significant. And so, um, so really, I think a, a, a focus on when now we start returning back to work, when um, it's really focusing on the benefits of and allowing people to really be able to be who they are, right? Establishing that sense of psychological psychological safety, so to speak, so that you really, really get the best outcomes out of them um, and an over, you know, and kind of a, a higher focus on, on the benefits of that than we've probably seen in the past. Yeah, and I would add what we're seeing, um, first to your question about agility. So our technology teams have, you know, have been delivering using like agile methodologies and principles. So from a software capability, feature development, that's been in play. To have the whole business operate at that level, you know, we first had crisis response and we did. We had a command center and daily and the situations were changing daily and the flights were, you know, we were parking aircraft and we had to manage all of the different regulations and situations of all the states in which we operated. And then, you know, stop international flying, all the winding down of getting control of the crisis. And that was happening daily iterations, which is how we are trained to do emergency response should we ever have an incident. So we do training and drills for that. So that was a muscle that we had, we kicked in. Um, to actually now do restructuring of the airline with that same sort of intensity and speed to um, do, you know, we are fortunate the government um, was generous to support airlines with the CARES Act, but that too will come to an end. And so we have to get our industry and our business right side up so there's a lot of things that we're doing within our control to do that. And that is a weekly cadence that we did not do. And we are moving through that and we're moving through topics and when topics come and go and decisions are being made. And we're, I've been impressed to see how the organization at the top levels can shift like that. Um, you know, driving those conversations and 
what it does bring out something in Alaska's culture, it actually taps into a strength that we have, which is right or wrong, like we're great in a crisis. And it galvanizes us and it brings people together, even if, you know, 95% of people are remote and work from home. Um, there is a unity that comes with, we have employees on the front lines still going out and taking care of guests and flying airplanes and taking care of airplanes. They can't work from home. So it's creating so much um, more connection, even though we're not together, because we're all really focused on turning the company around to be successful again. And so I think that that has been, um, if there were silos, they're now like, the walls are thinner, people are working together. Um, we, we share the big set of problems that we're trying to, get to rally around. And um, I think that part has been the good. Now the question you're really poking at, I think Leo is, how do you maintain that when we achieve new normal? And um, I'm wrestling with that question and I'm thinking about it because we also have some um, organizational transitions happening. So you have different leadership and we've been discussing what is the new operating rhythm of the business gonna look like. And we don't wanna lose the goodness that's coming out of this. Um, and we wanna make sure we take what's good and leave behind maybe the things that weren't, didn't serve us as well, right? Cause there's a lot of learning going on. You talk about experiment yeah. learning, every day feels like an experiment in learning. We're like, well, that's not the right thing. Okay, what else, you know? And so I think given the environment and being very mindful of what's happening, being very present in it while we're doing it, and being able to take the best forward is really where I think I'm putting a lot of attention working with our president to say, how are we going to do this? Yeah. Well, I think also the, um, it's, it's brought to attention or has risen to the surface, the fact that there, it requires to have an integration of work and life, right? So uh, one, and there are incredible benefits to that. So I think, you know, in a traditional nine to five model, um, you know, employees and organizational, you know, operational models are built around the very structured set of working, right? And so, but now, um, you know, everything is, is just a lot more integrated. And, and so, um, and you're, as a result, again, you're seeing a lot of incredible output coming from, from people because I know people are able to really engage, uh, you know, at any point in time. And I think also things like, uh, at least for us, um, things like being able to engage through, through chat, right? And making decisions a lot more quickly by pulling in additional people into the conversation and, um, and, and having things be a little less structured, but yet more focused as a result, that decisions are made so much more quickly. And, um, and so one of the things I remember going into, you know, when we we're talking about doing the panel live uh, at South by, one of the things I said is, you know, email, for example, is going to be, you know, one of the things that's going to go, uh, we're likely going to really uh, be underutilized or less, you know, less used in five years. And so case in point, it's like that, uh, because that's just kind of somewhat of an archaic way of working in a lot of ways, right? In the last few months, we've seen that you make a more thoughtful, better and quicker decisions. Um, by being able to communicate at any time, anywhere, through any device, through things like, like chat. You, you pull in more people globally, right, to be able to execute on that. So, um, so again, I think that, yes, yeah, so like Sandy, to your point, like the whole operating model of how we work, you know, it's like not just like being able to be effective, you know, online and offline, but also just working through different tools and, uh, and having more data points accessible more quickly. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's something, you know, that, that one of the things we're looking at as well is, you know, how do you rethink about what is that integration, right? Because now you could, we know it's proven, right? You could do business in a much more effective and focused way. I think the one thing you're saying, Carol, that strikes me, and it, and it is different, I think, for my industry, is we operate 24-7 already before entering the crisis. Uh -huh. So what has become really important for a number of leaders is to make sure they can figure out where to carve a space for self-care yeah. for family, because um, I don't, and, and it's really become, how do we take care of ourselves and each other for the long game? Yeah. And I think that's what we've seen some of, because we've already been 24 seven on call, this and that, and responsive in that regard, and our operations are going 24 seven. But now because all the knowledge workers and all, everyone's 24 seven, it's been interesting. And 
you know, I spend quite a bit of time with my team checking in and making sure like, are they taking time to recharge and renew? Right. Because it's easy to get stuck to the screen. Yeah. Yeah. So another question. Uh, so we, we are envisioning the future and let's say 2025. 20, when we look back, what are the companies or kind of companies that created this future in your view? Um, I think one of the things, and I'm going to draft a little bit off what Carol said earlier, I do think there's some level, like higher order of integrated living with brands, with companies, with people that I think um, is coming through all of this that I don't, I think that'll be representative of a new normal. Mm -hmm. And so I think the companies that are going to do well are going to be those that, um, cements a place in people's lives that's deeper than just transactions. I feel like people, the, the idea of connection and being connected and being connected all these ways, it's deeper than just the technology allows, right? I think there's something more going on there. This is what I'm observing and experiencing. And so I do think the companies that win in the future are gonna be those that really find a place in communities and people's lives that has more meaning than transactions or that sort of just binary um, interaction. Yeah, and to add to that, it's I, I would say it's also companies that are able to enable the integration of work and life to take yeah. place and to provide kind of those end-to-end -end services for whatever it is they provide. Uh, you know, for example, everyone is ordering from Amazon, everyone's ordering food online, goods online, all this stuff, right? So you're ordering online, you're getting your, you know, things delivered to your doorstep, now things need to get picked up, still, things still need to get returned, right? And so, um, you know, organizations that are able to, let's say, you know, instantly pivot to leverage, let's say, the gig economy, put things together and, and pick up those returns so that people have less to do, like the kind of non-essential elements of their life that need to be done so that they could focus on what is fundamental, which is essentially their families, right? And so being able to focus on the work, uh, integrate that into their life and all the non-essential things to so the goods and services and so forth that they also need um, that's kind of taken off their plate right through organizations that just do like that end-to-end -end experience um, and so people just focus on the things that are important so again I think it's uh, and this is where kind of my earlier point about the integration of additional you know single use case scenarios are gone right but it's like the uh, you know companies that are able to leverage um, each other in order to provide a good or service, right? Um, those are the companies that are going to do very well. And I think, again, like the last few months have shown there's been a propensity, I think, in the past for some companies to build a lot of things together or, or themselves, right? Where, uh, you know, due to the, or, you know, the necessity of having to go to market much more quickly, I think some companies are recognizing the importance of focusing on what is their core competence and not necessarily building things uh, in addition to expand that, but to actually partner with those who already have other use cases that they could leverage, which could be their core competence, right? And make this ecosystem to enable clients to, to have, uh, you know, to have the goods and services um, that they need, right? And just focus on the fundamentals. So it's providing that full, that end-to-end -end experience, but not necessarily uh, all, all, all of it coming from the same company. You, you know, it's plugging into the ecosystem and providing that in a way that for the customer, it doesn't matter, uh, right. you know, where is it coming from, but you have the full experience uh, and, and it's being provided by several players that you might not even be aware of. Solidarity was really uh, uh, emphasized, right? Everybody actually all of a sudden saw the need to help each other and, and, you know, we're all seeing small business going out of business. What, what can, can we do? And, and, you know, all of this conversation uh, was happening. So you see that this is something that, that also is going to stay and even grow stronger after the crisis mode? What I see um, happening is... And, you know, it's been crisis upon crisis upon crisis, right, the last few months. And so I think that it's, re everyone 
that I've been working with seems to be taking stock of like their lives and themselves and just like what in the world. <laughs> and as a result of that, there's a renewed hunger for mission driven work. Mm -hmm. Right. I think Carol's is great. You want to be able to integrate your work with your life because you want to live a more purposeful life. But I think then for the hours that are going to be the work hours, wherever that falls for you, they want people are want are kind of resetting and saying, okay, I want to make sure the work I'm doing is, is in line with my values and looking for deeper meaning in their work. And I think that that will actually produce better outcomes. And so um, I think that's a point of optimism in, in all this darkness is I think it's actually going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. And I think it's going to spawn new products, new businesses. You're already seeing some of that happen. And um, I, you know, to your point about restaurants and local small businesses, you know, stronger sense of community and belonging. And so, um, you know, I do want to kind of be, I want, I'm bullish on all that stuff. I want, I want to think that all of this, through all of this, good will come and that good will stick. Mm -hmm. I think about Microsoft, where Microsoft was one of the first organizations to do business casual. Um, and that at its time was really, you know, it was just unique. And so now that's become the norm across all industries, not just in technology. But what that brought was this whole notion of the benefits of uh, transparency and authenticity and showing up as you are uh, into work. And their organizations that are able to do that are more profitable. There's just an enormous amount of data around that. And so this is at the next level of that, right? So again, people are all seeing each other at home, in their home. Um, and so uh, that, uh, again, it goes back to that psychological safety of the the importance of psychological safety to the culture so where you know if your employees are able to show up where they are right and they're all showing up in that way it's yielding a lot more creativity and just a sense of, of unity that 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 sticks and equates to just you know better profitability and so i think we do have signals from the past that indicate um that demonstrate you know areas that this has transpired before um, and, you know, and it sticks, right? It starts, you know, pulling into other companies, engaging through, you know, communication in different ways. And so I, I don't think this is, sure, some of it might go away, but I don't think we're going to spring back um, to where we were. The rubber band is not going to, you know, lose slack entirely and just go back to business as usual pre-March, pre right? I, I, I think that's uh, unlikely. And, and what's our role as leaders to... To make sure that that uh, the good things that came out of this stick. You know, it's interesting. Sandy brought up that we've had a few, obviously, uh, you, you know, enormous things to contend with in the last few months. And as leaders, again, that transparency of connection of like, hey, how you know, how are people doing? And what do they want to do about uh, you know what's happening in the world today with all the anti-racism work that we need to do and the focus on and. And going there, right? Having those conversations with, uh, you know, with your employees, with your peers, with your colleagues. People are doing this today, um, and I think continuing that sense of openness uh, across the board and really reaching in and getting to know people's perspectives and um, and think about just larger community issues, right? Than just like the traditional, like, okay, what's the status on this body of work? But like, what's your perspective on what's happening and what should we do collectively? Leaders to continue to have that type of engagement and connection with their employees is critical. Yeah, and I would add it's what, right or wrong, right? This, these, the circumstances of the last few months, it's made people more authentic. I think it's also made people a little more raw. Yeah. But I think what, I, what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling is that it's enabled, at least for me, to be more present in the moment because you're contending with a lot. And that level of presence um, that, you know, and grounding and whatever that, because you're questioning everything and you're evaluating everything. I think it's also allowing, at least what I'm trying to do with my team is like name the good things that are coming from this, like call it out, point at it. Don't just let the moment pass by and have it just be a memory. And so by doing that, I think you're building in goodness for the future. What are the growth moments that we're in now 
and we want to make sure we capture and harness and take with us as we move forward. And I, I think it's being, there's something about this level of intimacy in a conversation like this that um, I think allows some of that to get further, closer to the surface than it has in the past and then allow it to get some like legs under its little stick. You know, and I think that that's really a huge opportunity. And as leaders, I think it's giving people, really emphasizing the concept of a psychologically safe space. And we are in this together and we need everybody's ideas and thoughts to, to get through all of this. This is not, a, there's no book on how to solve for this. There's no one person, there's no Oracle with the answers. And so, you know, maybe the good and bad of the problems being so significant, so many, so overwhelming, it, it, um, it sort of, requ it requires everybody to participate. And so as leaders, then the job is to make sure you set the table and invite them. So maybe before they were reluctant to participate, now it's more important than ever that everybody participates. And I think as leaders setting that table for employees is really important and no time, I mean, no better time. If not now, when? So you think that we are naturally uh, moving away of the command and control mode with all of these happening? Can, can we be as bold as to say that? I think your question about who is going to do well in the next five years, the type of companies that will, will have done that. Yes. Yeah, I think, I, I think there will always be a time and place for command and control, and it might be at the onset of the crisis, mm -hmm. right? The house is burning, the patient is dying, like those kinds of things are going to require commanding. But when you get to recovery and resilience and growth, that's a much more engaging and collaborative way. And I think that this is opening more of those doors for more people to participate. Yes. Great. Yeah. So we talked a lot about the human and, and cultural aspects of this. How about capabilities? Because um, what we, we can see in the market, we have seen in the market, is that prior to all of this, many companies consider themselves a long way into their digital transformation, right? And in general, people couldn't even hear the term. Like, no, don't, don't tell me about that again. Uh, and what, in, in, in fact, some com companies were indeed very prepared uh, for, for something like this in terms of adapting fast and creating new experiences, new solutions. And, uh, and others were not. And I would say that the majority actually was not uh, where they thought they were in terms of readiness to go from a very physical type of services delivery um, to something a lot more digital. And of course, that varies a lot, industry to industry. Sandy, you are in one that, of course, uh, involves moving people from one place to another, and uh, you still cannot do that with, with an app. So, uh, you know, there's, of course, that physical element that, that is there for sure. Um, but, there, there, you know, I think that companies came to, the, many companies come, came to this realization and a really, a really a, a more um, raw and, and sometimes shocking view of their own realities and how ready they were. I, had you, I don't know if you have seen the same kind of, uh, 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 no, uh, 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 if you see in the industry and among your peers and, and people you talk to, if this kind of uh, reality came to to the forefront. Well, I think, you know, I, th I think we've all experienced like uh, the outages, right? So even things like as simple as like just having enough bandwidth, right, to go to this more virtual format across. It's like uh, early on, a lot of people are like, wow, you know, things are, uh, you know, the, the tools that we're using, whether we're on Zoom or Slack or Outlook or Gmail or whatever, but just did, people just didn't have <clears throat> enough of that infrastructure, even the basic, you know, some of those things, some organizations didn't have that. So, which made it in the, you know, first couple of weeks, a little bit challenging for everyone to be on at the same time. So I think that's one learning at its most kind of like base. Um, but yeah, I think again, this, uh, a lot of organizations don't already have these uh, 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 an integrated and ad 
<clears throat> aggregated infrastructure that support their, their, you know, their company. So, you know, from a technology perspective, um, things are really siloed and fragmented in a lot of ways. And if we are, you know, I think it's, it's helped companies to recognize that as we want to be able to uh, push things out to clients more quickly to address their needs in that moment, you need to be able to connect to a, a certain service, right, really quickly. And so that takes then your, internally, your, your infrastructure needs to be aggregated, right, to enable to, to for that connect, those connections to be able to, to get service through into your products and then ultimately into your customers. So, um, so I think it has kind of uh, brought to light the importance of really like uh, having that solid and strong infrastructure um, that connects, uh, you know, that is in a, in a way a lot more centralized, right? A lot of companies, especially, um, you know, well, uh, you know, companies that, you know, grew through acquisitions or go through having different products come on at different times, but yet those, you know, those, that system underneath it is not all connected. So it makes it really hard then to provide Leo what Leo needs across a suite of services if that stack itself is, uh, is decentralized so, or, defra or fragmented rather. So I, I think that's one of the opportunities that uh, uh, a lot of companies are recognizing that, um, you know, all the talk on transformation is all about the experience. Uh, but in order to bring that experience to life, it requires a certain set of, uh, you know, a focus on the infrastructure, right? To aggregate a lot of, that, right? To stand up those experiences. I think that's being recognized uh, more so than before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say one of the things that I think is really interesting in the space and, and given these times is if you're a risk averse organization, I think that these circumstances have, have put you in a place that you are going to emerge bolder and more risk, not risk oriented, but at least, at least risk capable because you, you haven't, I mean, you've had to maybe make decisions absolutely without all the information that you would normally go get to make a decision because the information doesn't exist. You have to be able to, um, and we're wrestling with that. We don't know when customers will come back to flying and what sorts of numbers. And so how do you make decisions across your organization when you don't know the end game? But you, you know, and so I think that it's, it's an interesting um, set of behaviors or, and skills that are being developed. I was laughing, Carol, when you told your infrastructure story, because right out of the gates, our leaders have been very transparent with employees, but the first webcast we went to put on didn't work because we didn't have enough bandwidth to do whatever, right? Couldn't get everybody to sign in. We're like, okay, that was embarrassing. You know, and we, but you learn, we learned as we went. We're like, okay, we need yep. more of this, fix this. So I do think we'll emerge stronger as a result. Some of it, we sort of stumbled through it. Some of it, we do have a couple teams heads down doing some infrastructure work because we are on the, we're on the back end of a recent merger. So um, as a result of coming out that, there's some infrastructure work we've had to build for our scaled size. And we're like, let's get it done now because when we emerge, we want to be stronger. We want to be fit you know, and ready to go. But it is interesting that um, I think for, you know, individuals or parts of a company or an entire culture of an organization that was very risk averse. Um, I, I'm, I, I see that there, there's some stretch there for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So back to that question, which companies are going to build that future? Uh, perhaps companies that allow more risk into their, their day to day uh, operations and conversion. of course, to a certain amount, of course, it's controlled risk, but, you know, uh, uh, allowing uh, these uh, decision cycles to be much shorter than before mm -hmm. with much less information and, and starting with something that can perhaps uh, show that they're going in the right direction or not before having to, to build something bigger or, you know, rolling out something that it yeah, costs a lot more money and puts a lot more into in, in risk. Right? I think it's going to infuse in organizations um, a, an, ex, an experimentation mindset, mm -hmm. right? Because we don't know the answers. So like we're, we're experimenting, feels like every day, but we have a lot of experiments going on right now to be like, is this the right answer? Yeah. And then getting data and watching the industry and see what's happening to be like, okay, we have to make some adjustments. And, um, and I, I don't know that that was rampant in, our, in my organization, 
but I see it stepped up. And it, you're right, it's managed risk versus and mitigated risk versus just reckless behavior. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the yeah. opportunity to like, we don't know where this is going. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we have to, we want to try something in this space and see if we can get good results or maybe get not the results we wanted, but at least we now know. Yeah. There's more awareness of the need for that, right? Yeah. As, as you can basically throw in the garbage your forecasts of the future, they no longer serve any, any purpose. So, yeah. and you need to learn as, as you go, right? So there's the awareness of our own infrastructure, uh, problems that we need to solve in order to, to create uh, room for all of this collaboration, as Carol was mentioning. And there's also this awareness of how we go out in the market um, in, in a much more um, adaptive way by means of experimentation, as, as you mentioned. Right? I just would like to hear from you. What's, what's your experience with the new way of um, collaborating and even in activities that normally thought um, of as things that need to be done in person? Northwestern Mutual um, is a high touch business in the sense that clients work on their financial plans uh, traditionally in person with a financial advisor. And so that is, um, and so that, you know, was the way of viewing prior to a few months ago. Now, that still is the way that we're doing it. Um, but, and, you know, we've been, you know, really open about this for us. Like, the company has weathered times like this in the past. You can imagine in the last 162 years, how many well, depressions, right, the company's gone through or had to see the economy go through and it's weathered. It's, it's, so in that regard, the company was, you know, more than ready for any type of scenario such as this one to be able to weather through it. However, uh, what was different though is that uh, engaging differently, which is traditionally has always been in person, all of a sudden now we can't do that. That was a new scenario. Uh, but even in that, so, so that, you know, we had to put a lot of things in place to ensure that advisors were still able to engage with their clients. Um, but now we had to do it virtually. So enabling the advisors to make the best decisions for their businesses and figuring out how to do that, um, you know, with their clients and giving them really the, the freedom, the autonomy to do that has been tremendous because one of the things, you know, we've been public about is, you know, actually the companies, the business is quite frankly, you know, at, at, you know, an all time high. And so in these last few months, and so because clients have been engaging and our advisors and clients have done what they've done in the past, but we realized without having to pilot it through multiple use cases and so on and so forth, just through being forced to need to do it, that it works there, you know, the tools to be able to engage in, you know, in your financial plan for your future, it, it works just as effective, if not more so, um, when you're doing them in this format too. So to your point about how you leverage clients in this, essentially all this has been co-created with clients, right? It's not like we tested and well, how do you engage with them differently? It's, Clients have co-created the engagement model that has been very, very, um, you know, impactful in the last few months with the advisors, with our organization, uh, because really there was no other way to do it but through that co-creation, right? And and figuring out what they needed and okay, cool, then let's let's put things in place to meet you there, um, versus uh, you know having an idea for a pilot, let's test this in certain markets, yada yada. It's just happened nationally, right, through uh, you know client engagement. It's interesting when I listen to you describe it, Carol, because what comes up for me, and I'm not trying to um, to like oversimplify the experience you guys had, because first of all, congratulations that you guys are doing great, because um, we're working on it. <laughs> but um, no, I think, but what really struck me as you were sharing that experience is there's a history of companies that like build to sell. And this, what the scenario you just described was you're building to serve. Yes. And it's, and you know, I, I would I want to believe that organizations in Alaska um, builds to serve, but I think a lot of companies, they build to sell. Yeah. And I think that may be another um, change that comes through this is, you know, sell's not enough. You've got to serve, you've got to meet the needs. Yeah. And I think that that's, um, 
I don't know. And I wasn't trying to oversimplify that, but it just came up as you were describing. Yeah, that's a great way of describing it, Sammy. Yeah. I can't, I can't see a better way to, to finish this, to end this, uh, this panel. That's terrific. So, uh, Carol and Sandy, I, I would just ask you if you have any, any final remarks, any comments for, for our audience here? My overarching one is the importance and the impact of culture and culture and that uh, enabling employees and clients to come together as they are yields to some amazing outcomes. And so, uh, you know, that's kind of the, the, the main thing. Is the importance of that is, uh, is enormous. Yeah, I would, um, if I was gonna add anything, I would say it's probably underneath culture, access and connection. And I think having those two things working hand in hand is how you get to culture. But I think that um, is, it's, it's a huge opportunity and we're, we're living it now and we gotta make sure we don't lose that. Thank, Thank you, you so Leah. much. I, I, I feel so fortunate to have you two uh, joining me in the, on this panel. It's fantastic. I, I, it's always very enriching to, to, have, uh, to be in a call with you. Thank yeah, you so much. This has been a great conversation. Thank you. It's, 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 Carol, it's good to see you again. Leo, it's good to see you again. I really appreciate the conversation. Likewise. Yeah. Thank you, guys. It's so good to Thank see you. you. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.